Hello and welcome to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. This week, we're going to be talking about social care, an issue which has been with us in terms of needing to do something about it for a very, very long time. And we think maybe the government might, at some point this year or next, come up with some actual propositions and policy on this. I'm delighted to be joined today by two leading experts in the field. One is Natasha Curry, who is the lead on the social care program at the Nuffield Trust, which is one of the country's leading think tanks looking at health and social care policy overall. And also by Andrew Dilnot, one of my predecessors here at the IFS, currently the warden of Nuffield College, Oxford, but actually, most importantly, for the purposes of today, the author of the Dilnot Report, oddly enough, named after him, which was the last major report making proposals for changing the social care funding system. And I think, Andrew, that was seven or eight years ago now that your report was published, and not an awful lot of action since. But just before we get into the, you know, what should we do, perhaps you could start by outlining where you think we are. So there are two perspectives on where we are. One is to say social care is fantastic. There are one and a half million wonderful people working, delivering social care to uh, people who need it, as well as many, many more hundreds of thousands of people giving informal care. And the love and dedication is fantastic. And the reason we need so many people is that we're living so much longer than we used to do. And that's fantastic, too. So there's one wonderful aspect of social care. Then there's another side of the reality, which is that the level of funding that goes into the provision of social care through the means tested social care system is completely inadequate and has been inadequate and growing more inadequate for at least the last 10 years and and probably for longer. So that the amount of care that is delivered by the means tested system to those who need it isn't enough. The pressure on those doing the delivery is unsustainable and the decisions having to be made by those who are managing the systems in local authorities would try the wisdom of Solomon. We have inequality across the country as a whole. So so a fundamental problem is that we're simply not spending enough on looking after some of the most needy people in our society. And then on top of that, we have a system where the rest of the population that have some resources that they could use of their own to pay for their social care have no way of managing their social care, no way of managing the the uncertain risk of whether they will be people who need an enormous amount of social care or very little or be walking up Snowden at the age of 92, have a heart attack and die and never need any social care at all. So we have a failure to look after those who are the least well off, which is disgraceful, and a failure to provide a system for the other, let's say, two thirds of the population that allows them to manage it, which means that the population as a whole is terrified of social care and that being somebody who works in social care is pretty hard going and typically very poorly paid. And being a provider in social care is very difficult because there there are very few returns to investment or innovation. So this is a classic example of where, as a society and as an economy, we should do better. And it is staggering that we haven't done that yet. Well, that's fairly comprehensive and a fairly comprehensive indictment of uh, of where we are at the moment. Natasha, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think um, Andrew's pretty much covered it. I mean, I think it's it's always helpful to think about what the system is ultimately delivering before we talk too much about the kind of structural fault. So ultimately, we have a system that's delivering inadequate care. We have visits of, you know, 15 minutes uh, for people that cover a a very narrow set of care care needs. No, No time for the the care worker to to attend to any wider needs, no flexibility. And then the care worker may be coming back for another half an hour in the evening to put someone to bed at eight o'clock. You know, there's no, there's there's a part of the system that's very inflexible and it's not delivering the kind of, I think, enabling service that most of us, speaking personally, would want if I I were to need care services. So I think there's a real failure at the end in terms of of what we're delivering. And then Andrew has has pointed to the, the struggles within the workforce and the 
provider market as well. And then ultimately it comes down to how much we we put into it in terms of the, the money. It's worth um, reminding ourselves um, perhaps a little bit more about what social care actually is for the purposes of, of, of this. It's, it's both the delivery of services to people in their houses when they can't, uh, can't manage by themselves. That might be cooking, cleaning, uh, help with getting up or going to bed, uh, as, as well as residential care for those who really do need uh, full time looking after. Uh, but in addition, we often think of social care as something that affects only the elderly. But certainly in terms of the budgets of local authorities which are spent on social care, I think it's right in saying, Andrew, that something like half of that actually goes to people of working age. And indeed, that may have been the fastest growing part of the budget over recent decades. Yes, that, that's right. About half of the overall adult social care budget goes on people before retirement age. And that has been growing particularly rapidly. And again, some of that is the result of huge progress in managing to avoid early mortality for people who've been born with significant uh, restrictions on what they can do on their own, but with appropriate support can lead really uh, fruitful and enjoyable and good lives, but it can be very expensive. So part of the reason that we've seen an especially strong squeeze on spending on older people has been that local authorities are, are needing to choosing to, quite rightly, spend more on the growing number of younger people who can benefit from social care. And, and that has that has caused pressure. It's worth setting all of this in some kind of context of scale, though. The overall level of spending on adult social care in the UK is less than 1% of national income. Uh, it's not 2% of total public spending. Uh, the amounts of money involved are small relative to the amounts of money that we see involved in the health service, or the education system, or even the defence system. Uh, this looms very large in people's lives, but in terms of the scale of it as a share of the national economy or relative to public spending overall, it's sufficiently small that one of the astonishing puzzles is, given the scale of it, why has it been so difficult to get on and get something done? Well, let me throw that question back at you. Why, why has it been so difficult to get on and get something done? So I don't know the answer to that. And Natasha, I suspect, has also been puzzled by this over, over many years. You know, we had a, a royal commission in 1998, early in the Blair Brown government, um, that for 10 years led to nothing much at all. And then some proposals in the run up to the 2010 election that ended up uh, getting blown out of the water by a political row. Uh, the commission that I chaired wasn't, I'm afraid, paused seven or eight years ago. We, we, we published 10 years ago. We started working on it 11 years ago. We finally published 10 years ago. It's gone on and on. Why, why doesn't change happen? One thing that MPs said, certainly around the time that we published our report in 2011, was it didn't figure very largely in their post bags. So they didn't have an awful lot of their constituents campaigning about it. My reflection on that is that that's partly because by the time a member of your family has been through the social care process and then eventually died, you're typically so exhausted that although it's been frustrating and depressing, don't have the energy that we might see often in slightly younger people um, who might have had a difficult experience with a child, say. So, so part of it is, is just energy. Part of it, I think, is that we're all a bit scared by it. So we don't much like thinking about that end of our lives. We don't, we don't want to focus on that end of our lives, so we don't think about it too much. And then a third, and I think really very important element is, uh, I think significant reform means two things, in terms of funding at least, many other things as well as funding. But in terms of funding, we need to put more money into the means test, and we put bits of money into the means test in the last three or four years. We need to put a very substantial amount of money into the means test. That's something that the Treasury doesn't find too difficult to get its head round. But we also, I think, need to do something bigger. We need to expand the envelope of state activity. There are things that we're not doing now that we ought to do. And getting the state, the community, all of us to do a new thing, I think, is much hard, even harder than getting us to put more money or change the way in which we use money in an existing thing. So those are three or four of, of the elements of why it hasn't changed. And I'm sure there's much else, including that people like me haven't done as good a job as we should have done in building up momentum. And Natasha, I mean, I, I'd be interested in your views on this, but also 
um, whether there's anything to learn, not from what other countries have done, but but how they've gone about uh, making change happen. Yeah, I think there's a few things going on here. And I think one of the key issues we have in this country is that people don't understand what social care is. Uh, you know, we're all aware of the NHS. We go to the GP from, you know, from being born. We Everybody knows what a hospital is. Not many of us know what social care is until we or a family member need it. So there's not that understanding of what it is and then there's a low understanding of how the system works and it comes as a horrible surprise to people to find out that it's not state funded it's not part of the nhs and that actually um you know more often than not you're going to have to pay for pretty much all your care so there's so we have this basis i think it's about 40 percent of people in the last survey of this believe that it's free as part of the nhs so I think that makes it a bit of a difficult context in which to then introduce new proposals for a, a new system that ultimately will need funding and contributions from the public. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult one, I think, for politicians. I think that explains Andrew's comment on why why politicians weren't getting letters about this in their post bag. People don't people don't understand it, and I don't know if that's going to change as a result of COVID and the profile that social care has had possibly this might be where it where it changes and so i think on that within that context of low public understanding then there's there's a potential for social care proposals become very politicized as we saw in the 2010 election with the posters uh, dubbing the i think it was the labor proposals death tax and then again in 2017 we saw theresa may's proposals called the dementia tax it becomes incredibly politically toxic and so I think not many politicians then are brave enough to sort of revisit it. Um, so I think those are the, the, the some of the factors that are underlying this. And also, we, as Andrew said, you know, we have a system. It's very different to get people to think differently within the structures that we have. Um, and it's not all about the funding or some structural issues. But when when a service is so underfunded, there's not much headroom within councils, within providers to think differently and to innovate about what, what we could achieve differently. Um, the other thing I think has been a problem, in the certainly in the last decade, is that we often start and end the debate about social care reform with funding. And we start with the question, what will it cost and who's going to pay? Whereas I think the question we need to be asking is, what do we want to create? What sort of system do we want? What's the vision? And then to build support around that. So we start from quite a negative place, which I think doesn't really help. Uh, and just 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 drawing out from that in terms of you know you know looking beyond the our shores, um, this is obviously you know it's an issue faced around the world. The populations are aging around the world. People are surviving longer into adulthood with, um, uh, with severe disabilities around the world. So this isn't a UK specific or actually an England specific. Uh, um, issue. This is something that lots of other countries have had to grapple with. Is there any good? Um, is, there, is there any good examples of good practice elsewhere, both in terms of the process of getting from something not very good to something better, as well as the lessons for what the better might look like? Yeah. So we've looked at Germany and Japan as two examples of countries with sort of alarming aging profiles and similar sort of challenges to. Of what we face to see how they went about reform and I think both of them used a window of a political or economic sort of turmoil as an opportunity to change the conversation so in Germany it was after reunification which opened up a whole series of debates about society and spending in Japan it was after the economic crash of the early 90s so in 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 times of kind of you know, national stress, they, it's, been, it's actually offered up a window of opportunity to change the dialogue. And again, I don't know, maybe it's COVID our window of opportunity, COVID and Brexit together, maybe there are opportunity. Um, coupled with that, there was a groundswell of public support for change. So there was, for, and it's hard to understand why that was different in, in other countries to here, but there was a broader understanding of what the problems were. So there's a lack of supply, there was growing discontent about the burden on, on informal carers. So it's coupled with social change and sort of changing attitudes to, to women, mainly becoming um, informal carers. And 
instead of becoming kind of politically toxic in both countries, it's interesting to note that it became a kind of political vote winner. So the political parties, uh, it was really high on their sort of, um, on their list of priorities because they knew that if they didn't address the issue of, of social care, they wouldn't get the vote. So it, it kind of shifted um, into becoming a, a vote winner. And then they sought to build on public support for change by creating a vision for what they wanted to achieve and that was done over a long period of time we're talking you know best part of a decade in, in both cases to get it from the very early discussions to you know implementing so they they worked hard to create a, a vision for what they wanted to create and built the public support around that and they, they designed the system to address issues in society very very clearly so in japan a big priority was to shift the responsibility of care from families to society in order to free up mu much of the working age population. They've got a shrinking working age population. They needed to release women into the into the workplace. So there was a, 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 a very clear sort of societal issue that they were trying to fix and design the system around, around that. And did, did they manage to achieve a degree of political consensus around this? I mean, was this essentially done in a fairly consensual way without the, as you were referring to, the absurd, it's a death tax, it's a dementia tax kind of to and fro that we've had here? Yeah, I think they both both countries went through their own journeys on this. And it, and I think that we were told in Germany, the first report on social care and the need for reform was in the mid 70s. They didn't reform their system until 1995. So they've gone through a similar journey just a, a few decades earlier. Um, so I think the political system in Germany helped because they're used to coalitions, they're used to that kind of negotiating and, and coming to a consensus. So there was maybe a, a sort of contextual difference there that we don't have in our adversarial um, system. But I think because it became such a crucial political issue, there was an incentive for political parties to come together and work together. There was also a, a key figure in the German system who saw this through. He had respect across across the parties um, and he was really the face of reform and he sort of commanded respect and, and brought parties together in japan it was it's a slightly different situation but there was definitely a, an agreement among the political parties that change needed to happen so they were in a position where there was a, a high degree of consensus that something needed to be done and then the, the negotiations around what it was happened and i think we're getting to that point here there's got the high level of agreement that we need reform but perhaps we haven't quite got to the next step of what that reform should look like so uh, andrew where, where where are we on, on on that journey i mean you're as you as you rather depressingly pointed out your your report is, is now 10 years uh is 10 yeah. years ago i mean at one point it looked like you might be this person who was getting the uh the respects across political parties and um and driving through change uh, what you uh, what you proposed i think was even legislated but just never um never signed into law it, it was even signed into law the queen spilled ink on it it received the royal assent um so the legislation was passed to put in place the structures that we described and is sitting on the sitting on the statute book all ready to go it, it, funny enough i think this relates back to one of the points natasha made that happened during the coalition government so between 2010 and 2015, when there was a coalition government, uh, we reported in 2011. In 2013, the government finally said, yes, it would act. And, and my impression is that it said it would act because one, one of the coalition partners said, OK, we'll do this. And then the other coalition partner felt that they had no option but to say, OK, we'll, yeah, we'll do it too. And so that, it, was, it was in a coalition. But then as soon as the 2015 election took place and there was no longer a coalition government, that agreement broke down and it was pulled. I think we, I think there is now a fair degree of uh, agreement about at least the building blocks of what's necessary. I think there's there's universal agreement amongst the kind of stakeholder community and those who uh, work on this that we need a really significant increase in funding of the means tested system. Um, that the system that is used to look after those who can't look after themselves is simply creaking in a way that is intolerable. There are all kinds of ways in which that is seen, the experience of those who work in it, the experience, as Natasha has already described, of, of getting a quarter an hour visit two or three times a day, uh, the experience of those administering. So, so we need a significant increase there of the order of probably three or four billion pounds a year. Three or four billion pounds is less than half of 1% of public spending. 
but is the best part of half of what we spend on elderly adult social care workers. There's a big increase needed there and all kinds of consequential changes to the way that assessment is calculated to what is being delivered to eligibility. Um, so I think there there's, there's pretty widespread agreement. Then there are some who would say um, that we should just make the service free for everybody. So we should move to an NHS type model. Um, and we could move to an NHS type model. That would be feasible. Obviously, it's a significant increase in expenditure. And my understanding of the politics of all of this at the moment is that the, the Labour Party is not sure whether to commit to that or not. So far, haven't committed to it. If we don't commit to universal free provision, then I think there is also recognition that, that if we are to do something for everybody else, we should do that through uh, a form of social insurance that provides cover beyond uh, a cap. So essentially social insurance with an excess. There's a reasonable question to ask, well, why on earth should we do anything for the rest of the population? Um, why should we provide state help to those who have resources of their own. We don't do that for food. We don't help older people with their food unless they happen to have few uh, resources of income and wealth of their own. Why should we do it here? And there's a very clear answer to that, which I think is now widely understood. And that is that, uh, as we said earlier, the probability of needing a large amount of social care is unknown. Uh, the three of us, we don't know which, if any of us will need a large amount of social care. Um, but, but we could need social care that could cost half a million pounds at the end of our lives if it turns out that we have a, a very severe and long-lasting dementia or very severe arthritis, which means that we need 20 years in a residential care home. Or it could be that we need nothing. The average need is probably of the order of about 30, 35,000 pounds. So maybe the equivalent of less than a year in residential care or two or three years of domiciliary care. Faced by that, the optimal thing for individuals to do is not to try to save. Almost none of us can possibly save enough that we could cover our costs if we end up being one of the unlucky ones. So the sensible thing to do is to do what Winston Churchill wonderfully characterised, uh, first of all in 1908 and then again in 1943, when he said, social insurance brings the magic of averages to the rescue of the millions. That is somehow or other, we all want to pay the average cost that all of us will pay. But if we then end up being one of the unlucky ones, we're covered. And if we're one of the lucky ones, we've paid a bit and we needn't have done. Uh, that's what we should do. Deciding on exactly what level you should set the amount that people have to contribute to their own care before the state comes in, I think is a, w will reflect people's individual political preferences and the political realities. So I think the, on, on the funding side, the two big issues that need to be tackled are properly funding the means tested system and then doing something to allow the rest of us to manage our affairs properly. It's important to recognise that if we do that, that helps to give some possibility of a sector that works for providers and workers as well as for individuals. I've often said that at the moment, needing social care is like being in a shop with no prices because you know how much it's going to cost to have yourself or your mum or your grandma looked after per week or month, but you've no idea how many weeks or months that will go on for. And that, that technique makes all but the very wealthy feel very anxious and try to spend the least they possibly can. Only by taking the catastrophic risk at least away have we any chance of getting a market that functions. And if we're not going to nationalise the whole thing, then we need a market that functions. So that, that, that social insurance, that getting rid of catastrophic risk, essentially means that the government would decide that you, know, you pay your first 30000 or 50000 or £70,000 of costs and then once the cost gets above that, then the state steps in and pays the rest. Now, Andrew, you've, you've painted quite a, a positive picture of um, broad agreement on the need for more money for the means test and for the kind of um, uh, the kind of proposal proposition that you're you're making there. Um, Natasha, are you as positive about that that we we, we all agree um, on this, or, or, or do you see any um, any uh, any roadblocks along the way? No, I think there's broad agreement that the, the means tested system needs a lot more money. I mean, I was looking at the ADAS report that came out this morning, and I think there's 55,000 people waiting for a needs assessment. 12% of them have been waiting more than six months. 
So there's a really, really significant issue at that end. So people trying to access council support and that's just waiting for the assessment. There's you know, there's no guarantee that they will then actually qualify for care because you not only have to go through a means test, so looking at your assets and savings, etc., but also a needs test. So you need to have significant enough needs for the council to fund you and that that needs sort of eligibility has been rising so we have a really really crucial um, issue here with unmet need that I think there's a a broad agreement on and then I think one of the other issues is the catastrophic cost issue that is one of a multitude of reasons of of issues within the system and I think there's broad or growing agreement now that the, the system needs a comprehensive reform and we can't just tinker around the edges and do a little bit here and a little bit of extra funding here we need to look at the whole system from how we raise the revenue how we redesign eligibility access get the provider market working pay the workforce uh, a reasonable sum and make sure that people are receiving the care that that they they need and that they want and and when we look at the reforms in japan and germany they did just that it was a, a wholesale reform they put in place those foundation blocks and then they've been able to sort of tweak it as they've gone along and adjust the system according to changing need demand etc but we really need to do that sort of foundational but the building blocks and putting them in in place so i think that the cap is part of that so protecting against those catastrophic costs i think a lot of how effective it will be depends on the detail of where the levels set crucially what it includes so are we just in, are we just talking about personal care so the kind of life and limb getting up getting dressed getting washed eating or are we thinking about broader social care so supporting people to go out to work to take part in activities to to go to the cinema to meet friends that's the, the i think there's uh, sometimes a lack of understanding of the terminology here so personal care which is free in Scotland is the, the very basic sort of help with daily living broader social care is a huge array of activities from shopping and cleaning to going out and about so what are we talking about within this what's going to be included um and then alongside that where's the means test going to be set um, and how are we going to raise the money another crucial point which will determine kind of how fair the, the system is so let's talk about that raising the money. Andrew, you've stressed that we're, you know, in national economy terms, in the centre public spending terms, we're not talking about vast amounts of money. But if we're looking at a big increase in funding for the means test, plus um, a putting in place this cap, we're probably talking at least 10 billion plus a year um, in, in the medium run. That's manageable, but it's not nothing. Um, and the truth is a lot of the a lot of this in the end runs up against worries about that cost. Now, is it your view either we shouldn't worry about that or it should just come out of general taxation or that we need some kind of additional or a targeted, hypothecated, earmarked way of, of, of funding that? So I think my general view is that the funding of the means-tested system should come out of general taxation. The way in which we fund all of the ways in which we look after those who are most needy is in that way. And uh, that money is going to have to be spent, whether there's a programme of reform or not. For the last three or four years, the Treasury has been having to put in an extra billion pounds or so every year just to stop the means tested system from falling down. And I think that that should continue. So I think the funding of the means tested system, I don't think there's a strong argument for um, a tax increase that is identified as being for that, because I think that's just part of the general needs of running running a civilised society. I I think the provision for people beyond the means test, absolutely there should be some uh, clear way in which that's funded. When when, when social insurance was first introduced in this country, the famous slogan was ninepence for fourpence. I think uh, employees are expected to contribute fourpence a week, employers threepence a week, and uh, the state twopence a week. for something like this, the main reason for the state doing something like a cap is that there's a missing insurance market that the private sector will never deliver. That doesn't mean it should be free, that there should be no premium. So I think it's in, it would be entirely reasonable for some tax increase to be introduced. Now, of course, 
I spent, as you know, Paul, the first 21 years of my working life at the IFS. So I can't say hypothecation without a dagger coming into my heart. Um, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, but but I think we also have to recognise the uh, the importance of signalling in all of these things. I would be perfectly happy to see uh, either an increase in VAT or income tax that was announced because it was necessary to pay for this, or an increase in national insurance contributions to pay for this, or honestly, a health and social care levy that was modelled on the national insurance contribution base. But but there's one thing I'd say about the national insurance contribution base and indeed income tax to some extent, but the direct tax system in the UK at the moment is very favourable, and particularly the national insurance contribution direct tax is very favourable to those over retirement age. Many of the beneficiaries, I mean, in the end, all of us will be beneficiaries of this and not just those who ended up claiming on it because we don't think the only beneficiaries of car tax, car insurance are the people who end up having car crashes. We all benefit from being insured. Um, but I, I do think that it would be entirely reasonable to impose this levy on those over retirement age. So something on broadly the national insurance contribution uh, tax base, but imposed on not only on those below retirement age, but also on those beyond retirement age would seem entirely appropriate. A big change in the economy in the last 50 years is that the average income and wealth of, of older people has grown massively. And that's something hugely to celebrate. But it's also something that means that we should have a tax system that's designed with that in mind. At the moment, we don't have that. So I think we should we should have a, a charge through the tax system to pay for this. Uh, but it's very important that charge should be paid by older people as well as by younger people. Natasha, is that? I mean, that presumably is broadly something that you would um, buy into. It's obviously the sort of you know, it's obviously been the biggest block to everything uh, in terms of change, and hence the dementia tax, the uh, the death tax uh, that we've seen um, in, in in Germany and, and, and Japan. I mean, this essentially got funded through the social insurance system. Is that right? Yeah, so the systems are similar. Japan copied Germany, it's used it, Germany's system as its blueprint, but tweaked it in some quite interesting ways. So in the German system, it's solely funded through social insurance. So that's a very strictly ring-fenced national mandatory tax, if you like, that, that people pay in, and it's managed by an arm's length non-departmental body. So it's kind of depoliticized and it's very transparent. You can see it on your paycheck. You pay in 3%. Half of that from you, half of that from your employer, you know where it's going. So there's a transparency there that the German the German politicians felt was really key to gaining public support. When Japan mirrored that, they recognised that, that, that hypothecation comes with some issues um, because it's quite inflexible. And Germany has run into problems in recent years because of that inflexibility. So what Japan did was to decide to fund half of the system through this very transparent social insurance um, and then the other half through general taxation. So they've kind of been able to, to have that transparency, but also the flexibility to respond to, to changes in demand. Um, the other thing to say in both those systems, the, the, the care is not free at the point of use either. There is a, a contribution from, from the individual when you access care. Um, in Japan, that's sort of capped and controlled. So there is a, a protection for individuals. In Germany, it's become more of an, an issue and people are facing higher costs. And that's, they're, they're, well, I've just put into legislation a cap actually on those care costs for, for individuals. So yeah, there's some really interesting learning there. I think in, in both systems, they've, they've sought to pull risk across society They've sought to be transparent and clear about what's going in and what the benefits are. Um, and then they've sought to create a fair system in their context. And I think there's a really interesting debate to be had here about what's fair in our con context. And, and Andrew picked up some of that around the intergenerational fairness issues and the, the, the wealth, the disparity in wealth, regional disparities as well that we, we need to be mindful of when designing a, a, a new revenue raising system so so we got it seems a fair degree of consensus around the need for change a fair degree of consensus that more money is needed to boost the means tested part of the system at the moment a fair degree of consensus that we need to cap people's costs we've got good experience from other countries which seems to have worked pretty well 
but we've had 25 years of failed efforts to reform. So the last question to each of you, and Natasha, perhaps you could go first. Are you optimistic? Hmm. <laughs> That's a difficult one to answer. I mean, I think, I, I feel like, you know, that to coin up, use a horrible phrase, but if not now, when? You know, if, if, if post-COVID we can't see the need to reform the system, then when are we going to do that? You know, this is a, looking back at the other countries I've talked about, you know, it, I think this is our window there's been a, such a, 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 a spotlight shone on, on the issues within social care. No one can deny that this doesn't need change. There's, a, a, I think, a high degree of public support. And if, if we can create that sort of narrative and a, a positive vision about why we want to create a better system, then I'm optimistic. But I, I don't know. It's hard to say because, you know, obviously the, the Prime Minister has repeatedly said that there is a plan without seeing the plan it's really difficult then to have those debates and to build that support behind the plan um so i i am i optimistic sort of <laughs> i think Guard, guarded optimism from natasha andrew i think economists have a strong polyannerish streak or at least i do so i'm always optimistic about almost everything partly because i think um in the end the behavior of people is strikingly rational you know people do wise and sensible things en masse politicians perhaps don't always manage to do that as easily as the population as a whole i am reasonably optimistic uh, as natasha said the prime minister has repeatedly said he will do this uh, the, the queen's speech earlier this year said that there would be proposals brought forward in 2021 i think there is a realization especially post covid that probably politically it'd be better not to do it at all than to do it meanly um so I think if there is to be action, the political as well as the moral and economic imperative is to be generous because otherwise we've seen prior attempts that have done more political damage than good. So I am reasonably optimistic. I think the critical part is where the money comes from. So I think provided a clear source can be identified for the funds, then there isn't an argument for, for being mean in the use of those funds. So I think the role of the Treasury and the Chancellor in this will be critical. And while the amounts of money involved are not so large that it couldn't just be done with without a specific tax increase, I think the Chancellor and the Treasury and probably the whole government realise that uh, there are many other demands on the public purse. And so giving way on one without identifying a source of revenue isn't going to be the right way. So, so yes, I am optimistic that by the end of this calendar year, and I hope long before that, not only will proposals be brought forward, but they will be brought forward in a way that is generous enough for most of those who are concerned to be supportive. They won't be what all of us wanted in every dimension, but we desperately need action, and this is the year to do it. Well, that's probably not a bad note to end on, a note of optimism, a I think almost a prediction from Andrew there that we're going to get not just a set of propositions before the end of this year, but a, a decent set of uh, proposals coming from government. Let's sincerely um, hope uh, that, that Andrew is right um, and that Natasha's guarded optimism is also well placed because we have had such an extraordinary length of time of failure by politicians uh, on this and the human consequences. Let us not forget the human consequences here have been devastating and will continue to be until and unless uh, we uh, get the collective uh, will uh, to fix the system and find the money to do it. Um, thank you, uh, Natasha. Thank you, Andrew, for a fantastic conversation. Thank you, everyone, to listening uh, to the IFS Zooms In. If you want to hear more, do go to our website, www.ifs.org.uk, where you can also see uh, all of our other work do come along to our online events and also look at ways in which you can support us thank you